Reverend Victor Resendiz. I'm one of the associate pastors here at MDMC. And uh, well, today's my last Sunday here at MDMC, actually. I just got appointed uh, up north, uh, a four hour drive, uh, to uh, White Chapels United Methodist Church in South Lake, Texas, which is in the Dallas Fort Worth area. Uh, but it's been an honor, and I've been so just uh, privileged to be able to serve here at MDMC for five and a half years. I can't believe it went by that fast. Um, but I will miss you. I will miss you, even though I am excited to what's to come. Let's read scripture this morning. This is from the Gospel of Luke. Hear the good news. Just then, a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down the road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil wine on them. Then he, put on, then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out the two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of, this, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. Beloved, this is the word of God for the people of God. Our loving God, I surrender this space and I open myself to your inspiration as I share this sermon. May your message be clear and inviting to those that hear it, that my words facilitate our encounter with your spirit. Our hearts and minds are available for you. Amen. Amen. George Harrison was known as the Quiet Beetle. He was the youngest of the Fab Four. As a solo artist, George Harrison began to evolve he began to write songs expressing his search for God through spirituality. George Harrison of the Beatles was perhaps one of the most spiritual of the four. His spiritual quest began in his mid-twenties when he realized for the first time that, and I quote, everything else can wait, but the search for God cannot. Last time we did this uh, playlist series, I shared with you all that uh, my love for music was majorly influenced by my father, especially Beatle music. He taught me to pay attention to the meaningful lyrics and to listen to music that spoke to the soul, as he used to say. Music is a soundtrack of our lives because music can transport us to a meaningful time in our journey. We all have songs that bring us life and uplift us. We all have songs that are personally meaningful and inspire us. Beloved, this morning, through the inspiration of this song, Give Me Love, we are going to explore how we can search or find love 
and peace through our spiritual journey and how we can display it to the world. The song, Give Me Love, describes a disposition of prayer and openness. It contains soul-searching lyrics of vulnerability. This song is a prayer with the desire to be close to God's presence, and the lyrics remind me of Paul's words in his letters to the Thessalonians, pray without ceasing. I teach contemplative spirituality, and one of the spiritual practices that I teach is called Lexio Divina. And I highly recommend this practice. And the way I explain it or simplify it is that is you read scripture and you allow to, for it to meet you where you are or to speak with you. So it's entering into scripture and personalizing it. So there may be a word or a phrase that may prompt your heart at the moment that you're reading it and you stay with that. So whenever you are able to practice this is whenever you select your time of devotion, whether it is in the mornings or your, during your walks, or those of you that garden. Anything that captures and lets you reflect on where Scripture is inviting you. And that's what Lexio Divina does. And several years ago, one of my contemplative teachers gave us permission to do this type of practice with regular songs. If you listen to the lyrics, there are three movements in this song. There's a prayer, a plead, and a mantra. Listen to these prayer lyrics. Give me love, give me peace on earth. Give me light, give me life, give me hope. Now, when we hear love and peace, we think of a hokey way, maybe a way that we've over-romanticized what that represents with the hippie days of love and peace. It's a utopian feel to it. But for us, believers in Christ goes deeper. If anything, we are invited to apply this in order for us to display it here on earth. We are instrumental to bringing love and peace to the world. Also, this song is a plea, reaching to God. Pay attention to these lyrics. Help me cope with this heavy load, trying to touch and reach you with a heart and soul. Please take hold of my hand that I may understand you. Won't you please, won't you please? Seems like George was getting in touch with seeking a connection with God for genuine transformation. This plea is to experience God's love at its fullest. The song is a mantra because of the repetitious style of the main verse. Give me love, give me peace on earth, give me light, give me life, give me hope. So this morning I ask you, how do we attain peace? How do we attain love? What do we ask for in our prayers? Do we ask for peace and love? We cannot have love or peace on earth unless we find our own individual inner peace and unless we are open to fully experience God's loving compassion. During Advent, I ran into this prayer that really impacted me in so many ways. But there was a specific a uh, phrase that stood out of this prayer that really impacted me, and I sat with it, reflecting on it, what that represented. And that expression was said, expand my embrace. And I began to ponder on it and think about it. And this morning's parable provides us with an invitation to consider and to apply this unique invitation. In the book, Extremists for Love, author Rufus Barrow provides a radical theological reflection by Martin Luther King Jr. using the parable of the Good Samaritan that invites us to genuinely consider what it means to expand our embrace. King told the biblical story of the Good Samaritan as an illustration of what happens to the individual who undergoes a revolution of values. King reasoned that the difference between the behavior of the priest and the Levite and the Samaritan was that the two former men were operating on the old truncated value system that placed self above and before others. They functioned according to a value system that was I-centered rather than other-centered. When we read this parable, we uh, have a tendency, especially in our culture, to always look for a hero and a villain. But see, beloved, Scripture was not written that way. Scripture was written for us to reflect 
and to enter into the story of where are we in the story. And so, of course, we're always going to get away from the villain uh, character and select to stay as, you know, far away from that character. Well, here's a perspective that was very profound about this parable. The first two men, and it's not to mean to be critical or condemn them. This is to observe. And again, if you enter the story, this, you will relate to them as well. The first two men walk by. And according to King's reflection, is that the question was, what's going to happen to me if I risk myself and help this broken man on the road? So as we read, they kept walking. The difference of the Good Samaritan is that he turned that question around and he said, what's going to happen to that broken man if I don't help him? And you see, beloved, we as Christians have a really good way to pat ourselves on the back and motivate our goodness. But we, through our gestures, will be, will give to a cause and provide it with resources or our time or invest in it temporary. But as long as we're not entangled in whatever is causing that suffering or that pain, then we come back and say we're good Christians. But see, we were invited to go deeper, to go further. We're not much of risk takers. But I begin to think about this story, and as I'm inviting you to go into it, I'm pretty sure if I sat with you individually, you would tell me a story when you experienced God's compassion and mercy, where you were the broken man on the road. See, beloved, it's easy to forget that, those times, and so it's easy for us to reject an opportunity for us to help in such a way that we're even paying for somebody's debt. So something to ponder about. In the song lyrics this morning, there's uh, this lyric that stands out, help me cope with this heavy load. And so I ask you this morning, when was the last time you sat down and coped with a heavy load in your heart? And maybe you were going through something very difficult individually or personally or within your family. But when was the last time you were heavy about the world and everything that we see, the suffering and poverty and all the things that sometimes because we're so busy, we just keep moving along. You see, our world has plenty of suffering. What is it about us that we are so prone to inflict, inflict pain on ourselves and others. We create and take part of all sorts of systems of division. We find them in everything from our family dynamic all the way to our social settings. I mean, select one. Our family disputes, our biases with one another, the political picture. And I know that's a touchy subject, but let me tell you, it's not just in our country. This is worldwide. Anything that has to do with politicians inflict pain on others. But if we're not participating in systems of division, we take part of it with our attitude. For instance, we have a tendency not to put ourselves at risk, as I mentioned earlier, for others that may need help because it is too compromising and it threatens what we have. But what we learn from the Good Samaritan story that there's care, diligence, awareness and intentionality. Dr. King's reflection on the Good Samaritan is an example of God's unconditional love. King calls it a dangerous unselfishness. And for me, this expression is aligned to the phrase and the invitation to expand our embrace. So I ask you again this morning, beloved, how do we attain peace? How do we attain love? What do we ask for in our prayers? Do we ask for peace and love? What if our daily desire was to expand our, our embrace? You see, peace and love begins with us. There's another spiritual practice that I teach in the contemplative ministry that is called examine of the journey. And the way I simplify the explanation of how this works, it's um, being sincere and going into inner inventory in your inner warehouse. 
What are those things that you observe about yourself that just don't need to be there anymore? So what I do, I walk around my inner warehouse on a daily basis, and I look at attitudes and things that I just have piled up there that are just have become useless or not necessarily bring the best out of me. So then what I do is I bring them into the sacred space, and then in a confessional way, I can tell God, here I am. I need to outgrow this. I need to mature if I'm going to be an advocate of your kingdom. So this type of disposition provides us with an opportunity to be love and peace here on earth. I was reflecting on this question to myself as I was practicing my inner inventory. What is the experience, what is it like to experience an encounter with me? When people leave me, what do they leave with? Is it a pleasant experience, a loving experience? Did they generally feel me lean into their story? Or did I rush them because they're too long-winded? Or because my calendar and everything else that I got going is too important? So I ask you the same question this morning, beloved. What is it like to experience an encounter with you? When people encounter you on a daily basis, whether they are part of your inner circle or folks that you run into doing ordinary life, what is that like? Do they leave with a sense of genuine connection? Do people leave you experiencing love and peace? Or do they leave with an unpleasant experience? Guilty. Just because I'm a pastor doesn't, I'm not immune to giving unpleasant experience to others. And just like King's reflection, do you leave a, by a, self, a selfish value system where you come first? Or do you lead a selfless value system seeking to uplift others? You see, beloved, when we walk around on, da- on, on our daily routine, it doesn't take much to do a loving gesture for those that serve you, those that are, you know, taking care of all the things that we do during the day, whether it's a cashier taking care of a purchase that I made, It doesn't take much to look into their eyes, call them by their name, say hello, greet them, not treat each other like transactions to my next thing that I have to do. And those little things, that's where we see and display peace and love. So reflecting on this spiritual practice of the inner inventory, that might be a good start to allow our inclination for genuine transformation. In the Great Commission, Jesus asks for the disciples to go around the world and give the good news, and that's our Great Commission as believers. But see, the beginning of that commission was genuinely to walk life together. Then it became this competition of different denominations and different branches of doctrines and theological perspectives. But there's nothing wrong with that, but then it just became this sort of arguing of, well, you guys are doing it wrong because y'all say it this way or you do it that way. So we've kind of lost the rooted commission of what it represented. And so the first believers were called the people of the way because there was something authentic about the way they led life. And so I pray that we go back to our roots and lead a lifestyle rather than just know our Bible and our doctrine really well. So this morning I ask you to sit still in this Good Samaritan story and who are you in this story? In the book Meditations on the Parables of Jesus, Thomas Keating writes the following, according to the parable of the Good Samaritan, the kingdom of God has no fixed social, ethnic, racial, nationalistic, economic, or religious boundaries. There are no insiders or outsiders, no elite or non-elite. The Abba whom Jesus reveals must be concerned about everyone else. Unconditional love is the name of the game. So beloved, I leave you with this personal reflection. When our daily prayer is like the song we heard this morning, 
where we place ourselves in a pleading disposition to ask God to help us experience his love, where we ask God to provide us with his peace, only then can we manifest love and peace in the world, and only then we will be able to expand our embrace. Amen. Our loving God, we're grateful for this morning. We're grateful for these parables that invite us into reflection, that invite us into a lifestyle. And I ask that uh, you've prompted our hearts this morning for us to come into your sacred space and allow you to continue to transform us in order for us to display love and peace in a genuine way, in an authentic way, into the world that needs it so bad. We ask all this in the name of Jesus. Amen.